So how different would your life look like? How different would your financial life look like if either President Donald Trump or President Kamala Harris is elected? Now, I posted a while ago on Instagram the five different policies of any candidate that will earn my vote. At the top of this list is economic policy. So I'll break this down in this episode of the Seven Figure Squad. Here, starting in three, two, one. Let's go. Let's get this money. What's cracking, everybody? My name is Smart Guy, Matt Sapali here, here to you from Dallas, Texas. And in this episode, I will be breaking down the five different areas of economic policy between Trump and Harris. And these five criteria are jobs and wages, tax policy, healthcare, climate and energy, trade, and globalization. So before I get into these points, I just want to point out, the reason why economic policy is at the top of my list, top of my economic agenda, personal agenda, because I believe a man who knows how to not only protect, but provide is a confident man. That man is a leader, not only in the home, but a leader in your community, a leader in the city, a leader in the state, and a leader in our country. But rob a man of his economic ability to provide for the people he loves and care about, I'll tell you, you've got an average beta lack of a man. And so when we're looking at economic policy, it's very important for you to pick out the areas that most attract you. Now, I'm gonna talk about the things that attract me about economic policy. But in this video, I want you to start educating yourself about other things that are most important to you. Maybe some of the things that you and I are discussing here maybe align with you, maybe they don't. But these are the things that I have realized as a single father, with three kids, with just a high school education, a 2.2 GPA, who's became an entrepreneur for the last 25 years. These are things that are most important to me because I didn't depend on anybody. I didn't depend on church. I didn't depend on family. I didn't depend on government. I depended on my ability to prosper in this country by the economy clearing the path for me to be a capitalist, for me to be an entrepreneur, for me to improve, for me to grow, for me to expand and broaden my bandwidth so therefore I have the capacity to build a business in the financial services industry so I can provide for the people I love and care about. And furthermore, this has allowed me to employ and contract over 5,000 agents across the country, allow us to contract well over 100,000 square feet of office space throughout all of our office spaces throughout the United States of America, it has allowed me to pay to other people that we've helped and coached and mentored well over 100 million dollars in commissions to them that we mentor in the insurance industry throughout the respective offices, cities, and states that we coach and mentor people in. So not only is it important for me, but it's important for me to continue to do this because the more I grow as an entrepreneur, the less people I have depending on government and the more independent that they are as husband, as husband and wife, as leader in the home, they're creating jobs, they're not leaning on government, they're not leading society, they're leading in society and they're leading and raising the next wave of children to do the same. So let's talk about economic policy, number one, tax policy. So let's take a look at what these two candidates have to say. Trump, his corporate tax policy. He reduced the corporate tax rate from 35% down to 21%, making the U.S. more competitive globally and leading to higher investments from businesses. This allowed companies to reinvest their profits into job creation, higher wages, and expansion. Now, many argue that these tax cuts were key to record low unemployment rates right before the pandemic. Now, Trump's income tax policy using the Trump, Trump, using the Trump Tax Cuts and Jobs Act gave significant tax breaks to families and individuals across all income levels. A typical family earning $75,000 a year saved $2,244 in taxes, with business owners and investors also seeing major benefits, spurring economic growth. Now, I started developing and growing my agency in 2015. So through the Trump administration, I've not only seen my business be affected by policy from the federal landscape, not only in Chicago and in Dallas, but also through the Biden administration, both in Chicago and Dallas. And I'll tell you this, because of the Trump Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we were able to save significant amount of money in having to pay additional income tax that we did in previous administration. And what do we do with that? Well, we created more jobs. Instead of paying another 50000 here, another 50000 here, we created more jobs. We created a job instead of sending it to Uncle Sam in terms of federal income tax. We used that not only to create a job, but guess what we also did? We retired my in-laws, mother and father. Gainfully retired after a lifetime of work, we were able to take some of those resources that we would otherwise have to pay in income taxes to retire mom and dad so therefore we're going to live life and enjoy this chapter of life in dignity, enjoyment, traveling the world, taking advantage of photography, taking advantage of what they love to do in terms of watching and enjoying sports activities. They are now living that life in 
comfort because instead of us sending extra money to Uncle Sam, we're able to redirect it to the people who love and care about it. Wouldn't you want to do the same? Now let's take a look at what Kamala is doing in terms of her proposal. Kamala, corporate tax. Kamala Harris wants to raise corporate taxes to 28%, potentially reversing the benefits that businesses saw under Trump. Higher corporate taxes could lead to fewer jobs and reduced wages as companies adjust to higher expenses. Now on income tax, she proposes increasing taxes on higher income households, potentially slowing investment and job growth in sectors that drive the economy. The way I look at it, they are both going in opposite directions, trying to stir the economy on who they're going to extract additional taxes from. One's going to try to raise the taxes to create more income tax revenue, wants to lower the income taxes to create more revenue, to create more taxable revenue, to increase the GDP of our country, and then tax it from there. Which one of those two do you think makes the most sense? Put in the comment section below. Raise income tax or raise revenue to be taxed? Again, please put in the comment section below. Okay, here we go. Trump versus Harris income tax plan. Let's check this out. The average American saved on taxes as a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But the saving was disproportionate. A middle income taxpayer saved about $900 by 2025, whereas the top 1% saved about $61,000, according to estimates from my shop, the Tax Policy Center. By the way, that's $61,000 because my wife and I were seven-figure income earners at that time. It's interesting that they just said that. That's $61,000 divided by 12, that's $5,000 a month. That's exactly what we needed to retire our mother and father. So instead of it, again, being sent to Uncle Sam and hoping that Uncle Sam is the better stewards of our tax revenue, which by the way, do you see what they're doing with our tax revenue? Where they're sending our money? Do you agree with it? Or do you not agree with it? Put in a comment section below. So instead of sending this additional money to Uncle Sam, we decided to, you know what? Let's make sure we retire a mother and father. And they have a different job with us working the family business, but they're working with us. And again, in this chapter of the life, living in dignity, happiness, and enjoyment because they earned it. All right, let's continue. Bill was we doubled the standard deduction. So today in America, only 9% of Americans itemize their deductions. That's an amazing thing. That's a record low. That was one of the greatest tax simplification measures. On the campaign trail, Trump has put forth additional policy proposals he would pursue on top of extending the TCJA. He's talked about exempting tip income from taxes entirely, and he's talked about exempting Social Security benefits That's great. from taxes. To exempt Social Security from taxation would accelerate Medicare insolvency you know, by six years and Social Security's insolvency by one year. Well, that's the downside. Pain point for seniors. What he's basically saying is in increase the insolvency. In other words, it will spend down the Social Security and Medicare faster because there's less money from the government to take from our gross paycheck or payroll tax to fund Medicare and Social Security. So the insolvency rate of Medicare, the insolvency rate of Social Security will be a lot faster faster in our years than later because the proposal of Trump is not to tax Social Security. I will also say this too as well. He also went on the campaign trail this week and he said, I will also create tax deductions for car interest loan. By the way, do you know how many people will be helped by able to deduct the interest they owe on car financing? How many people out there in the multicultural middle income demographic, small business owners, have their cars financed? Right now, you can't write off the car finance. You can't have, as a business owner, but for typical Joe who doesn't have a business, that's a massive deduction on their end. By the way, in the 70s and 80s, it used to be that you can write off the interest on your credit cards, you write off the interest on your interest in car loans, etc. The only way you can write off interest right now on your taxes is if you have a mortgage and you're a homeowner. So these are some of the things that Trump wants to expand on what can be tax deduct on the things that everyday Americans purchase. And of course, Social Security is such a key issue during this election that it's easy to understand why he may have proposed that. If Trump wins the 2024 election and is able to enact his plan into law, the average American's tax return will likely remain mostly unchanged since he plans to extend the 2017 TCJA. However, these tax cuts may lead to a significant increase in the federal deficit. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from the start was going to grow the federal debt. Congress budgeted itself $1.5 trillion of extra tax cuts. The Republicans pursued a strategy of borrow and spend, in effect. They understand that cutting taxes would increase the deficit. I think their theory is that cutting taxes pay for themselves eventually by spurring more economic growth. I don't think we saw that. I think very few people believe tax cuts pay for themselves. 
but tax cuts are immensely popular. Well, here's the thing too as well. I as an individual, I as a entrepreneur, a United States veteran, guess what I never had to depend on? I never had to depend on government assistance. I'm not a person in line. By the way, I'm not even filling out a loan for SBA loan. The only government benefit I took advantage of was my VA loan as a veteran. And I bought property and brought properties with my VA loan. So I further put more jobs and financing and currency in the marketplace because I am moving money as somebody that understands my own personal economic policy. So what you will create is a nation of people who are independent of government assistance and dependency on church charity and other uh, nonprofit organizations. Everything we have to do should be oriented towards one thing, increasing the rate of economic growth of our country. Yes. The Congressional Budget Office, or CBO, estimates an extension of the TCJA would cost the federal government more than $4.5 trillion over 10 years, including interest payments on the debt. That's about a $1.1 trillion increase from the CBO's projections in 2023. It did cut taxes. It also stimulated new investment, a little bit more growth, which raises tax revenue elsewhere. But even accounting for those positive benefits, it still cut taxes, increased deficits, and ultimately increased debt. Taxes support our spending. And in the long run, taxes and spending need to balance. In the short run, we can borrow to spend, but eventually we will need to repay that borrowing. The U.S. borrows a lot for its spending relative to other industrial countries. We tax relatively lightly, but spend comparably to other industrial countries. That leaves our deficit growing. When we're borrowing that money, it tends to come from foreign investors. So the returns that we have to pay for borrowing that money go to foreigners rather than those returns going to Americans. Hint, 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 politicians those in charge of our money. How about this novel idea? Why don't you actually look for ways to cut spending? Because if you can cut spending, then you have to borrow less. Novel idea. Who's gonna have the guts to actually look for ways to start cutting government spending? And I'll give you an example. When I was in the military, I remember us just ordering simple things like pine salt to clean the barracks. And I was part of the, exp I was the expediter. I was in charge of supply, making sure my unit would draft from the supply what we needed for our barracks to, to do our job. And one of those things was, cleaning supplies. I remember the cleaning supply, and this is the 90s, early 2000s. And I could go down to the store, go and get Pine Sol, and it's four or five bucks for a bottle of Pine Sol. But we had to go through our government contracts. So when I ordered it from supply, and I saw the invoice of what a contractor charged the federal government, because I was ordering it, to clean the barracks, instead of going down the street to Walgreens or a grocery store to order and buy Pine Sol to clean the barracks, we we're being charged five, 10 times the rate. So instead of it being $5, it's now $25. It's $50 for one bottle of Pine Sol. So who's looking over these type of things? And, and by the way, this is just Pine Sol. What about other things that the military, like hammers and weapons and other things that anybody would need in the military? Are we being upcharged by contractors, by companies out there, and nobody's paying attention to the spending that we're doing? If they're doing it to this, I can only imagine how many unnecessary things go out there. Another key example. Remember when Elon Musk bought Twitter? Well, not only he bought Twitter, but what did he do the following day? Everybody complaining, guess what he did? He fired everybody. And you know what he found out? That this entrepreneur that took over Twitter, he bought Twitter? You know what he found out after firing everybody? I can run Twitter on less employees. So what about our federal government? Which is fearful for a lot of people. Why? Because the number one employer in America, guess who it is? It's the federal government. Now you're threatening people's jobs. Well, instead of being dependent upon a federal government, which is basically our taxpayer money paying you a salary, this is a chance for everybody in America to improve. This is a chance for everybody in America to understand that there's a standard. This is America built on free enterprise and capitalism. Why don't you either start your own business or get your job in the private sector? Why depend on the government that has so much frivolous and unnecessary spending that very little people are paying attention in terms of accountability? Maybe that ever goes down the halls of Congress to say, hey, Senate Budget Finance Committee. Let's uh, take a look at our budget. Waste, 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 done. Close this down. No more spending here. The ridiculous things that our government spends money on, it will blow your mind away. But at the cost of who? Us. Because you and I have to deal with what? Potential rising income taxes because what they're trying to do to justify a higher federal deficit is so one day a politician say, hey, Tom, Dick, and Harry, we need to get in your pocket more because we need to pay more taxes. So that's why you want to make sure you're able to make your own bread, create your own bread, duplicate your own bread, and keep the most of it without any government involvement 
of you having to pay unnecessary over and above in terms of income taxes. That's my prayer. That is my hope. It reminds me of Arthur Laffer, a former economist. He said, the best income tax rate for everybody to be at is around 15% because it does one of two things. It's going to incentivize people to want to make money in this country. It's going to want to incentivize investment into our country. It's going to incentivize people to you're just being a worker. They're going to incentivize them to being a producer, creator, and generator versus just somebody milking the system and being lazy and not doing so. So which would you prefer? Would you like to have the government get out your way so therefore you can be a generator, producer, entrepreneur, and creator? Or would you rather be a leech on the system? Put it in the comment section below. And please, be honest. We'd love your feedback. Okay, so that was Trump's tax plan. Let's take a quick look at what Harris has planned. Harris has also endorsed Biden's budget for 2025, which includes a 25% minimum tax on individuals with more than $100 million in wealth <laughs> based on a combination of their income and unrealized capital gains. Unrealized capital gains. Harris wow. Harris put forward a plan that includes a 28% tax on long-term capital gains for any household with an annual income of $1 million or more, which is lower than Biden's proposed 39.6% <laughs> rate. <laughs> Vice President Harris in August proposed an increase of the corporate tax rate would boost that up to 28% up from 21%, which aligns with President Biden's fiscal year 2025 budget. The through line, I think, is imposing higher taxes on businesses and entrepreneurs and the wealthy and then using that to redistribute income toward other parts of the economy, whether that's families or home buyers. No. Nope. So really increasing the role. Zero chance. The scope of the federal government and using the tax code as a tool for doing that. If Harris wins the 2024 election, the average American making under $400,000 would likely see their current tax rates maintained, along with the potential for additional benefits from expanded tax credits. Lower income Americans might receive more benefits through refundable tax credits. It's unclear whether Harris's revenue raisers would be enough to offset the additional tax credits. In August 2024, Vice President Harris unveiled a number of economic proposals. And that collection of proposals, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget estimated that that could increase the deficits by $1.7 trillion over a decade. So now, the Democratic plan, the Kamala Harris plan, is to stick it to the billionaires. It's to stick it to the most productive in our society. Let me ask you a question. Do y'all plan to be rich one day? You guys are watching the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel, right? Meaning you wanna make seven figure income and above, yes? Well, once you become successful, if you're already successful, you wanna to continue to be taxed and gouged because you are successful? I mean, this is the land of three, the home of the brave, right? And you're pursuing happiness and you're achieving it and you're enjoying it. But guess what now, this Uncle Sam, this uh, liberal policy, this democratic policy wants to stick your hand further in your pocket. And what I heard was just a crazy mention there that they're going to tax your net worth also based on unrealized gain. In other words, you haven't realized, in other words, you have a piece of stock, you have a piece of real estate, that, or you have a business, you have ownership in something that you haven't realized the gain. In other words, still on paper, it's not in your pocket yet. But they want to tax that? You haven't realized it. It's not in your pocket. It's just on paper. But they want to tax that? It doesn't make sense. You haven't earned the income. You haven't put that money in your pocket yet. But they want to tax that that's still on paper. It doesn't make sense. Furthermore, you want to raise the corporate income tax? Guess what's going to happen to businesses all across the United States? Here's what's going to happen. They're smart. They're very smart people. And guess what? People with a lot of money, they can travel. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to re domicile their corporation, their corp corporate headquarters away from the United States of America. And guess these other countries, guess what they've done over the years? They've gotten better, they've gotten more attractive. Singapore, please come over here. Dubai, please come over here. Hey, um, uh, Switzerland, please come over here. Cayman Islands, please come over here, right? Bahamas, please come over. Other, Ireland, please come over here. You're gonna have these companies that America built, that was built in America, re-domicile to other countries simply because they're not gonna do what? They're not gonna wanna pay this 28% corporate income tax. By the way, flip side, you know what Trump did under his administration? He wooed business to come back and he gave them a tax benefit to re-domicile from other countries to come back home. So that's what Trump is doing, to bring these businesses back home. And here's the thing, I'm from Chicago, originally from Chicago. Guess who left? Ken Griffin, the richest man in Chicago, Citadel. He left to go to Miami. He said, bye-bye Chicago. He took 1,500 jobs with him. By the way, I can talk about New York, how many trillions of dollars of money that has left New York, trillions of dollars that have left Chicago, trillions of dollars that have left California and LA. And they've gone where? Talk about redistribution of wealth. Well, guess where they redistributed to? They redistributed to Texas, to Florida, to Tennessee. Why? Because people with money are smart. 
they have these conversations on what the best advances for them to be in with their financial situation. Do you want to redistribute not money from the United States, but you want to redistribute money for our brightest people to go in other pockets of the world? I don't think you would want that. So this here doesn't make sense. Zero common sense here when it comes to this plan to stick it to the man, to stick it to the rich. And by the way, why such an attack on the rich? Why such an attack on billionaires and decamillionaires? What did they do wrong besides innovate and create, create jobs, create currency cycling in our, in our, in our economy, create tax revenue for the cities and states that they're working in? You know, and that's what's happening right here in, in Dallas. The Texas Stock Exchange is coming to Dallas. Ken Griffin and Blackrock got some money together and guess what they're building downtown here in Dallas? To compete with Wall Street. Because smart money understands where to go, where they can make the most money to be taxed the least and where the opportunities are the greatest. You're gonna do this to Americans? You're gonna do this to people? You're gonna threaten the best and brightest people to move their businesses elsewhere, to employ employees elsewhere and who's not going to be benefiting? Americans. Is that what you want? Here's some thoughts on this before I move to the next topic. Trump's $2,244 tax cut for families. Real savings versus commas tax hikes on business, who wins? Trump's tax cuts, jobs, wages, growth. Commas tax hikes, who's paying for it? Second part is breakdown. Jobs and wages, let's take a look at this. Trump created 7 million jobs in his first three years by reducing regulations and offering tax breaks for businesses. A record achievement that showcased the strength of the US economy. He believes in empowering businesses to grow and hire more without heavy government interference. He opposes raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, arguing that it could hurt small businesses and lead to job losses. Instead, he believes a free market should determine wages, ensuring companies remain competitive. Now, Kamala, she supports a $15 an hour wage, which could hurt small businesses that can't afford to pay more, leading to layoffs and reduced hours for workers. While this may benefit some, Many economists agree that it could lead to higher unemployment in industries reliant on lower wage workers. Hint, hint, which industry have you seen this in already? Big time, retail, big time, fast food. You go to McDonald's, when's the last time you actually saw a worker? Are you ordering on kiosks and only the workers are delivering you the food? So how companies are responding is AI, robotics. If you're gonna force them to pay $15 an hour, guess what these companies are gonna do? They're gonna find ways to maintain their profitability. If you're allowing the free market, the free enterprise to dictate what somebody is worth, then you can give healthy competition that somebody wants to improve, someone wants to get paid, somebody wants to get in a position where they're a desired employee, a desired business to be in that area, let the free market decide and not government. So let's revisit the debate between Trump and Harris and what they had to say about economic plans. Everybody knows what I'm going to do. Cut taxes very substantially and create a great economy like I did before. We had the greatest economy. We got hit with a pandemic. And the pandemic was not since 1917, where 100 million people died, has there been anything like it. We did a phenomenal job with the pandemic. We handed them over a country where the economy and where the stock market was higher than it was before the pandemic came in. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. We made ventilators for the entire world. We got gowns, we got masks, we did things that nobody thought possible. And people give me credit for rebuilding the military, they give me credit for a lot of things, but not enough credit for the great job we did with the pandemic. But the only jobs they got were bounce back jobs. These were jobs bounce back, and it bounced back and it went to their benefit, but I was the one that created them. They know it, and so does everybody else. Vice President Harris, I'll let you respond. Interesting argument. By the way, what part of that do you agree or not agree with? Uh, let's take a look at um, Harris, her response. Donald Trump has no plan for you. And when you look at his economic plan, it's all about tax breaks for the richest people. I am offering what I describe as an opportunity economy, and the best economists in our country, if not the world, have reviewed our relative plans for the future of America. By the way, so many economists get it wrong. If I could tell you how many economists I follow in my last 25 years as an entrepreneur in the financial services industry, 80, 90% of all the economists in their prediction, all these economists in their prediction are wrong because they operate from a position of theory, whereas entrepreneurs, creators, generators operate from a position of experience and wisdom. What Goldman Sachs has said? is that Donald Trump's plan would make the economy worse, mine would strengthen the economy. What the Wharton School has said is Donald Trump's plan would actually explode the deficit. 16 Nobel laureates have described his economic plan as something that would increase inflation and by the middle of next year would invite a recession. 
You just have to look at where we are and where we stand on the issues. And I'd invite you to know that Donald Trump actually has no plan for you because he is more interested in defending himself than he is in looking out for you. Well, by the way, he, he went to Wharton School of Business, so I definitely got to do some more research about that person for myself. What about you? Here, here's my thing too as well. I know a lot of nasty things get put, but here's the reality and the world we live in. A lot of people felt more financially secure, jobs, wages, under Trump. Where have you been here the last three, four years? Have you been more confident financially, economically speaking? If you're out there, you got a job, you want to buy a house or rent an apartment, you're taking care of your family. Have you seen the cost of these things go up? Have you seen more of your income and salary go to just living versus having discretionary leftover cash? So therefore you can save for retirement, so you can save for things that you love and care about, save for things that you enjoy. Have you done that? Or has it been stressful for a lot of people? And there's been a lack of reinvesting back into themselves because you need some money to invest in yourself to increase your capacity if you want to be a producer, generator, or creator. So when you're looking at both sides of these conversations, and her topic said, you know, the economist said he'll blow up these economists. Okay, which ones are they? And what exactly are they reading? And what are they actually proposing? what Trump will do to blow up the economy. Because the last time I checked, the economy was doing pretty darn good up until 2020, and over $10 trillion of national deficit had been added in the last four years, So, and that's under which administration. So being objective and unbiased here to help you make an informed decision, we're sharing both sides. Obviously, with some of the thoughts and opinions on my end of what I've experienced. And by the way, just so you know, I'm a registered independent. I'm from Chicago. I've come down here to Texas. You know why we moved here to Texas? Because we feel safer creating jobs in an economy down here in Dallas, Texas. In 2021, I lost two of my life insurance agents to gun violence and getting carjacked in Chicago. Big reason why I'm here in Dallas. Safety of my family. Safety of my property. Safety of my business. Ken Griffin moved away from Chicago down to Miami, now down here to Dallas, Texas to build a Texas stock exchange because his employees feel less safe in downtown Chicago and sadly, they lost 1,500 jobs. They went to Florida. They're now coming here to, to Texas. How many or more other jobs are leaving these great cities and states because of bad economic policies that affect everybody? All right, let's jump into healthcare. Trump's position on healthcare. Trump appealed the individual mandate penalty under Affordable Care Act, giving Americans more freedom to choose whether they want insurance without being find. He focuses on lowering drug prices through market competition, allowing for affordable healthcare solutions without a government, heavy government hand. Trump's approach is about reducing costs for Americans while maintaining a free market healthcare system instead of burdening taxpayers with more government control. Kamala, Kamala wants to expand the ACA, the Affordable, Air, affordable Care Act, and create a government-run public option which would cost over $1.5 trillion and lead to higher taxes. While she argues this will lower premiums, critics point out that expanding government programs could lead to increased inefficiency in long-term higher costs. I'll just tell you right now, I'm already part of a government-run healthcare system. It's called the VA. And, and, and by the way, <laughs> I have a snow system, my L4, L5. Two of my patella tens was, was torn. And, and guess what I have here in my desk? I have my veteran's evaluation that my injuries after evaluation and physicals by multiple doctors, my DD-214 right here, the only thing they've determined that none of my injuries, by the way, I have an RBB ranch branch, right branch bundle blockage because I dehydrated in Okinawa, Japan during a, during a hump, during a 15 mile march with our, with our, with our pack on, I dehydrated and it messed up my, my heart rate, my, uh, uh, the, the, the electrical connections of, of my heart, achalasia because we flew through oil fields during the Persian Gulf War and none of my injuries according to this documentation, are service connected. Are you kidding me? By the way, I haven't fought for this or appeal because I figure some other veteran out there that isn't an entrepreneur, that didn't take the journey I've had, I don't need my VA benefits. I don't need to have the disability income. I don't need to go to the VA system. I created a business where I can make enough income to take care of myself, to take care of my own health care. My next door neighbor is a well sought out doctor right here in downtown Dallas, a cardiologist. Just having dinner with him the other day, he invited me to a dinner party. I met the attorney general here, Ken Paxton, just shows up because they're buddy buddies. But I have access to my next door neighbor who's a private doctor because I can afford my own health care system and I'm not dependent upon a government system. Do you want to be part of a health care system where it feels like coming to the DMV to run your government health care? Oh, you, you, uh, you qualify now for government run care, but your appointment six months from now. Is that what you want? Ask anybody in Canada how a socialistic health care system is panning out for them. Do they have quality? Do they have confidence? Or do you want privacy 
in terms of who you get your health care through if you can afford the premiums. And I'll say this too as well. Under Obamacare, I was paying $250 a month for as a single father of three kids for my health insurance premium. I was taking care of my family. I wasn't on welfare. I wasn't on Section 8. I'm taking care of myself. This country allowed me to be an entrepreneur, utilizing the free enterprise system, capitalism at its finest. But after Obamacare kicked in, guess what my premiums went to? It went from $250 to $2,000 a month. $250 a month to $2,000 a month. Once the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, kicked in. Did it work out for me as a small business owner? Did it work out for me as a entrepreneur, single father, three kids? I sucked it up and paid it. So when you're looking at how these folks want to put a feather in the cap, just because they say we're taking care of Americans in the process, there's also hurting a lot of people. Now, granted, there might be people that you can help, but guess what you can do? You can carve out some other system where you can help those that really need the care the most, but really help out the ones that already got their stuff taken care of. And I'll add this too as well. Any pharmaceutical company that profited from the pandemic, you owe that money back to the United States of America. You owe that money to pay down our national deficit. You should not profit for us having to go through the pandemic and people taking the vaccine and people taking additional health care. You should, any health care company, any pharmaceutical company that puts out a vaccine, that puts out any medicine, puts out any health care to profit from what we've been through as a national crisis, that to me is immoral and therefore you should send that money back to pay down our national deficit or find somehow to fund and finance everybody's public goals. I don't care. You shouldn't just be profiting from everybody's crisis. My take on it. Oh, let's take a look again what they debated on the last time they were together on this very topic. You now say you're going to keep Obamacare, quote, unless we can do something much better. Right. Last month, you said, quote, we're working on it. So tonight, nine years after you first started running, do you have a plan? And can you tell us what it is? Obamacare was lousy health care. Always was. It's not very good today. And what I said, that if we come up with something and we are working on things, we're going to do it and we're going to replace it. But remember this. I inherited Obamacare because Democrats wouldn't change it. They wouldn't vote for it. They were unanimous. They wouldn't vote to change it. If they would have done that, we would have had a much better plan than Obamacare. But the Democrats came up. They wouldn't vote for it. I had a choice to make when I was president. Do I save it and make it as good as it can be, never going to be great, or do I let it rot? And I felt I had an obligation, even though politically it would have been good to just let it rot and let it go away. I decided and I told my people, the top people, and they're very good people. I have a lot of good people in this, that administration. We read about the bad ones. We had some real bad ones, too, and so do they. They have really bad ones. The difference is they don't get rid of them. But let me just explain. I had a choice to make. Do I save it and make it as good as it can be, or do I let it rot? And I saved it. I did the right thing. But it's still never going to be great, and it's too expensive for people. And what we will do is we're looking at different plans. If we can come up with a plan that's going to cost our people, our population, less money and be better health care than Obamacare, then I would absolutely do it. But until then, I'd run it as good as it can be run. So just a yes or no, you still do not have a plan. I have concepts of a plan. I'm not president right now. But if we come up with something. I would only change it if we come up with something that's better and less expensive. And there are concepts and options we, we have to do that. And you'll be hearing about it in the not too distant future. Okay, there might be the knock on the Democrat side that his concept's not a plan. Okay, I get it. Let's go to Kamala. When Donald Trump was president, 60 times he tried to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. 60 times. I was a senator at the time when I will never forget the early morning hours when it was up for a vote in the United States Senate and the late, great John McCain, who you have disparaged as being, a, a, you don't like him, you said at the time because he got caught. He was an American hero. The late, great John McCain, I will never forget that night, walked onto the Senate floor and said, no, you don't, no, you don't. No, you don't get rid of the Affordable Care Act. You have no plan. And what the Affordable Care Act has done is eliminate the ability of insurance companies to deny people with pre-existing conditions. I don't have to tell the people watching tonight, you remember what that was like? Remember when an insurance company could deny if a child had asthma, if someone was a breast cancer survivor, if a, if a grandparent had diabetes? And thankfully, 
as I've been vice president and we over the last four years have strengthened the Affordable Care Act, we have allowed for the first time Medicare to negotiate drug prices on behalf of you, the American people. Donald Trump said he was going to allow Medicare to negotiate pr drug prices. He never did. We did. And now we have capped the cost of insulin at $35 a month. Since I've been vice president, we have capped the cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000 a year. And when I am president, we will do that for all people understanding that the value I bring to this is that access to health care should be a right and not just a privilege of those who can afford it. And the plan has to be to strengthen the Affordable Care Act, not get rid of it, Vice Pass President his Harris, thank in you. terms of where Donald Trump stands on that. One area I actually will agree with her in terms of the Affordable Care Act, stripping away the pre-existing conditions. Because of my health conditions from the military, I can get health care. So I will 100% agree with her on that. But does that mean my premiums go from 250 bucks a month to $2,000 a month just because of that pre-existing condition? And by the way, my pre-existing condition was not one of those healthcare type of situations where it's lagging long-term type of scenario, like a heart attack, stroke, or cancer. And by the way, if you look at the healthcare system, does the healthcare system, is it incentivized to promote healthcare or is it incentivized to promote sick care? Like they make more money, not with you being healthy, they make money with you being sick. I'll give you another example. Go to a doctor next time. You say, listen, I want, for example, let's get, a, get an MRI, get an x-ray. And say to the doctor, listen, I'm private pay. I don't have insurance. What will my charge be if I pay out of pocket right now? They're going to give you a cost. Versus if I didn't have the money for private health care, how much you charge my insurance company? Okay? And by the way, the cost, I promise you, will shock you. The reason why I know, I'm going through these MRIs right now. The MRI says, if you... We're here just on private, it's 500 bucks. But if you go with your insurance, it's gonna cost $3,000 for an MRI. What? So is that doctor's office is charging the insurance company $3,000. But the cost only to a private pay is $500. So in other words, you see the lack of transparency there with costs associated with just a simple MRI? What about the surgeries? So in other words, if I private pay out of my pocket, the price on somebody, if it's either private pay or they have a high deductible, but now they gouge the health insurance company 10 times the cost because now it's going through an insurance company. So the profit of healthcare systems, I don't know, man, it's not designed to get you healthy. And how many times have we already heard that we've already seen and heard of the cure for cancer, but where's my cure for cancer? You're not going to get the cure of cancer. You know why? Because it's very profitable for them to treat you with chemotherapy and all these different things to keep you sick instead of beating it. That's why we talk about living benefits all the time with our life insurance clients. We want to get a policy with living benefits on it because if you do have heart attack, stroke, and cancer and you fight through and you beat it and you're a cancer survivor, at least with a living benefit rider, you can get a portion of your death benefit while you're alive, not when you are in the ground. I talk about this story in my book, Gotcha, about Dustin and Kenya Frampton, the guy that built my website, moneysmartguy.com, at 38 years old, has a stroke, but thankfully, not only did he survive, but thankfully, he also had a life insurance policy that we put him on for 70, 80 bucks a month that he was able to get multiple six figures from to pay for whatever he wanted to pay for. So he's able to get that death benefit, not when he's in the ground, but when he's alive. So therefore he can enjoy his four, ch four children. He can still run his graphic design company and still enjoy his life with his wife. That's what getting people financially literate and getting them understanding about wealth and education, about money, that's what we really need to infuse into our country. All right, let's go to climate and energy. Let's take a look at this. Trump says on climate and energy, Trump made America energy independent for the first time in decades, promoting the use of fossil fuels like oil, coal, and natural gas which helped create thousands of jobs in energy-rich states. His administration rolled back more than 100 regulations, removing unnecessary red tape that stifled American business growth. Under Trump, the U.S. became a net exporter of energy, boosting the economy and lowering energy costs for American families. Kamala, Kamala plans to invest $2 trillion in green energy over the next decade, which critics argue would destroy millions of jobs in the traditional energy sector. While she claims this will create 5 million new jobs, the reality is that transitioning away from fossil fuels could devastate entire industries, leading to significant job losses. So here's my thoughts about climate and energy based on these policies. Listen, the last thing I want is an electric car. I can give a crap about an electric car. In fact, if you saw the movie Leave the World Behind on Netflix, at the end of the movie, what did you see? You saw a bunch of electric cars going nuts, self-driving, ramming into each other, creating unsafe conditions and jamming up that road. And here's the crazy thing about electric cars. I'm afraid of electric cars. Here's why. Because that's another way for them to try to control you. I mean, did you hear that Ford and all the GM electric cars, 
that if you miss your car payment, they start shutting off your air conditioning. You miss your car payment, who knows? They may just shut down your car and it just goes to, instead of hiring the repo man to tow your car, your car just detaches whatever route that you're on and goes to the repo site itself, drops you off so you can take an Uber home to repossess your car. So I just don't trust electric cars that be connected to some form of satellite or some form of GPS that I don't have control over. Last topic, trade and globalization. Let's take a look at this. Trump's America first trade policies protected American jobs by imposing tariffs on countries like China. These tariffs helped revitalize U.S. manufacturing and reduce dependency on foreign imports, bringing back jobs to American soil. The United States-Mexico-Canada agreement, which replaced NAFTA, is projected to add $68.2 billion to the U.S. economy and create 176,000 new jobs. Trump's approach has been about protecting American workers and businesses from unfair foreign competition. Kamala. Kamala supports more global competition. Kamala supports more global cooperation, which could lead to U.S. industries losing competitiveness and American workers facing more outsourcing. While she opposes tariffs, critics argue that this would leave American manufacturing vulnerable to cheaper foreign labor, making the U.S. more dependent on other countries. Listen, any policy that gets us more independent, stronger than our enemies, stronger with our allies, I'm all for it. I don't like being put in a position where over time, you and I, through Target, through Walmart, through the products that we purchase, have strengthened other countries because we've moved our manufacturing jobs overseas. And now what? How do, how do we get repaid by the world? Bricks? They want to de-dollarize the American dollar across the world? They want to come against America for us creating jobs for other countries? That's the way they thank us? For us putting jobs over in their country? No way, man. I'm not a fan. But if you're able to say, listen, because of the brain power, the innovation, the creation of our greatest entrepreneurs, the greatest think tank here, think tank right here in America, by putting the best minds together from all different nationalities and ethnic groups that we come here in America to put our brain power together to create a better world. I like that policy. Meanwhile, let's take a look at what they have to say here on their policies here on trade and globalization. Let's take a look. Trade is one of the few economic areas in which Harris's views differ from Biden's. As a senator, she voted against the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement and the Trans-Pacific Partnership Interesting. over her concerns about their impact on the climate and lack of worker protections. Oh, gosh. Harris has not released a former economic plan just yet, but economists expect her to remain aligned with Biden's vision. Since joining the race, Harris, Harris's Harris has said she'd make family-oriented programs like child and elder care more affordable. In the 2020 primary, she promoted the idea of a refundable tax credit that provides middle-class and working-class couples up to $6,000 a year. Well, there you have it. You can see one candidate's policy versus the other candidate's policy wants to strengthen who? Strengthen us. You and I, we have been weakened as a country in terms of trade and having other people come into our country they sell their products, they sell their goods, they sell their stuff here in America to us without any tariff, without any additional tax. Now we go to their country, and I've traveled the world, every time we go to a different country, Paris, Monaco, Dubai, all these different areas that we, Aruba, every place that we go to, Europe, every place that we go to in the world to buy things, guess what they do to us? Some form of VAT tax, some form of increased tax on that product. Now granted, it's their home state, so they have, they have to export it. But some form of VAT tax, some of tax, because Americans have to pay it too as well in their country. Well, guess what? Why don't they pay that same fair type of upcharge by selling the products and services here? Because who benefits? Who benefits? Who benefits with these tariffs? Americans benefit. That money comes to us, and guess what it does? It also strengthens American companies, American workers. If we protect other companies, foreign companies, selling the products, goods, and services here without any entrance. For example, how many of y'all have ever sold at a flea market? How many of you guys have ever sold at a trade show? Imagine the flea market and the trade show not costing you anything by selling there, but you profit from it. You made money from it, but you don't pay the house. What happens now if the house down the road doesn't have another event? Because you went the cheap route. You didn't, nobody contributed to the benefit of that, of that house. Well, here the house is America. And if we don't pay America and take care of America, somebody else will. Patrick David, a long time ago, said, listen, if you don't take care of your best people, somebody else is going to take care of your best people. They're going to leave. My favorite book. I think everybody should read. It's called Atlas Shrugged. I'll put the link in the description below, or you can watch the five-part DVD series. I love this book. Matter of fact, I think I'm going to get a tattoo from the book logo. But his whole process of who the hero is, who the criminals were, who the contrasting 
forces were. I'll tell you this, reading that book, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. She was a woman that came here from Russia. In Schreiser's book, Atlas Shrugged in 1957. A economic philosopher, an economic storyteller. But you read this book, you're shocked to see some of the things that she wrote in that book are shockingly similar to the economy in America that we face today. But in that book, you're gonna watch. Who's the hero? Who's the hero? You know who the hero is? The entrepreneur. Guess, guess who the contrasting force was taking away from the hero? Overregulation of government. And that's what we don't want. To have an overreaching government. We don't need more government. We need more entrepreneurs. We need more thinkers and creators and developers to help us create a better America, to improve the quality of life for everybody that's here in this country, where the American dream, I believe that to, to this day, is still alive and well. My last thought here too as well, as I'm looking through my notes, the fact that Kamala Harris' proposal for income tax and unrealized gains clearly shows she has some of the worst advisors in the history of America. She has some of the worst people that she's taken advice from, and outside of that, Lack of common financial sense. How the heck are you going to tax? Let me, let, me, let me repeat, let me just clear what the definition is of unrealized gains. Here it goes. Unrealized gains are defined as potential profit that exists on paper resulting from an investment that is yet to be sold for cash. Here's an example. Let's say you bought a house for $100,000. It grows to $1 million. This $900,000 of growth, this capital gain, is unrealized. Do you know why? Because you haven't sold the property yet because you're probably living in it. But what does administration, what does agenda, what does plan to do from potential President Kamala Harris says, hey, if you got that $900,000 of unrealized gain, I want to tax that at 28%, even though you haven't sold the house and put it in your pocket. Now, here's the flip side. Let's say we do have her as our president. And by the way, I made money regardless if there's a Republican or a Democrat in the office, regardless if I agreed or disagree with her policies. I still found a way to make money. My business still made money. I think many entrepreneurs will find a way to make money too as well. But let's say now in that example, you pay taxes that is $900,000 unrealized capital gain. And then because of these bad policies, we come into a recession. You remember the recession? I remember the recession. 07, 09, I remember that recession. Where $500,000 homes became $250,000 homes with $300,000 mortgages, underwater homes that they owed more than what the house is worth. So what happens if the the finagling of this economy based on these bad policies that this unrealized gain will usher in other bad policies. Let's say now this $1 million house that you just paid a 28% capital gains tax on $900,000 because of the recession, guess what happens to this house? And guess what happens to everybody else that has this type of house in the block like yours? The comparative market analysis, the comps in the area, they start going down. Why? Because people get laid off. They start foreclosing on the house, those houses that looks like yours. Next thing you know, a million dollar house becomes a $900,000 house, becomes a $800,000 house, becomes a $500,000 house. But wait a minute. You just pay tax on a house being $1 million. Is there any tax deduction for losing that equity, for losing that unrealized capital gain? Well, according to this agenda, there's none. There's no deduction for losing an unrealized gain, even though in the previous year you had to pay tax on it. So this here doesn't make sense. And guess what? You're going to stifle and stop investment, 80% in America, of this unrealized capital gain type of strategy. Nobody will want to invest it into anything. The idea behind investing is to invest in something, to see it grow over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. You're gonna tell me you're going to tax generational wealth? You're gonna tell me you're going to tax people that did the right part in terms of investing in American companies? Now you're gonna tax them because they profited at 28% and it was unrealized. They couldn't pass it on to the kids. In other words, you're gonna remove what they call a free step up in basis. So with that being said, my thoughts on that, doesn't make sense. Now, I encourage you to not just take my point of view on this. Continue to study, continue to dive in. Have these candidates, whether you vote for Trump or you vote for Harris, have them earn your vote because you got educated about their policy. Now, you can kind of tell where I'm leaning for this go around. And by the way, again, I'm a registered independent, but the economic policy for me is number one, buddy. I want to make sure that these economic policies allows me as a man to provide and to protect for the people I love and care about. So therefore, I can take care of my home, my neighborhood, my city, my state. And not dependent on anybody. And I can encourage other men and other leaders in our society to do the same. What are your thoughts? I want to know what you guys are thinking. Please put it in the comment section below. With that being said, please subscribe, hit like, and we'll see you in the next video. Till we meet again. Continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. Bye-bye.